Freud and the Psychoanalysis. Before starting, it might be useful to review some key terms. Psyche, or as the ancient Greeks would have pronounced it, zuche, means soul or mind. Analysis is another word we borrow from their culture, originally meaning to loosen the straps on something. They used it to mean breaking a thing up into its constituent parts. Psychoanalysis, then, is breaking the mind up into the parts that it is made of. Another key term in Freudian thinking is psychodynamic. This comes from psyche, soul or mind, and dynamikos, having the power to influence, which gives us the sense of psychodynamic as examining the mental processes that influence our behaviour, in particular those mental processes that we are not normally aware of. Freud's big idea, then, is that the mental processes that influence our behaviour need careful examination because we aren't usually aware of them. Some context before getting down to the details of the, the theory. Sigmund Freud was born in 1856 and died at the outset of the Second World War. He was raised in Middle Europe, being born in Moravia and then living in Vienna, by Jewish parents. Freud was never particularly religious himself, and nor his parents really, although he maintained that his Jewish heritage was very important to understanding his own motives and the nature of his own thinking. Freud grew up in a period of rapid scientific and technological progress. There was a popular belief at the time that human reason and science would uncover the secrets of the universe. At around this time, Lord Rutherford in Manchester was already arguing that science was in the process of dotting the I's and crossing the T's, discovering the last little nitty-gritty details that would help us to know the truth of things. This gave rise to a modern conception of humanity as being fully in control of its own destiny. The long-standing legacy of Freud's work is that this confidence was massively undermined. It wasn't just Freud who was about this at the time. There were other thinkers who were doing things that made people feel less certain and secure in what they thought they knew. At around the turn of the century, we might also cite the work of Karl Marx in economics, uh, Albert Einstein in physics, and maturing thought on people like Darwin, who were showing that the universe didn't really care about us as much as we might like to think. It might also be useful to think in this connection, modern doesn't mean the same as contemporary. It's not meaning up to date. It's related to an artistic or philosophical position. This in turn comes out of the 18th century notion of enlightenment. Modernists tend to idealize the potential of human rationality. They believe that we can give up irrational prejudice and biases and that we can create a society that gives each person as much support and freedom as is consistent with the rights of all other members of society. As a point of view, it favours the notion of rationality, self-interest, and the power of thinking and reasoning to overcome conflict, as opposed to fighting and war. Freud thinks of the mind as being made up of several parts. Each of these influence our behaviour and these influences combine in a dynamic fashion to give us our individual personality. Freud's earliest model of the mind is referred to as the first topology. He developed his thought in the book The Interpretation of Dreams, a text largely devoted to thinking about his own anxieties and dream images, memories of his early childhood. It does include case studies of his earlier clients. Many people have criticised Freud's approach for using this kind of material as the basis for his most important ideas. Topology is just a fancy word for an explanation of how things are related to each other in space. You might think of things like uh, maps and diagrams as being topological. A famous topology is the London Underground map. In his earlier work, Freud thought of the different parts of the mind as being above one another or below one another, beyond or beside one another. And this is why we use the image or the metaphor of space when thinking about consciousness. The conscious mind is where we think about the things we're focused on right now. It's the part of our mind that we're most familiar with. In some ways, it's also the part of our mind that's the most difficult to describe. Pre-consciousness is where we think about the stuff that isn't our immediate focus, but it's perfectly possible for us to make it so. 
If we're having a telephone conversation, it's the part of our mind that handles holding the phone whilst we concentrate on the conversation. Or if you're driving down the road and talking to somebody in the car, the preconscious handles the peripheral vision, the gear shifting, pressing the brake at the right time, hopefully at any rate. Clearly, these two parts of our mind can swap with one another. So the stuff that's in pre-consciousness at one time can become conscious at another, and vice versa. Now this idea of conscious and pre-conscious wasn't all that revolutionary. Many other people had observed something similar in the past. Freud brought to this theory a third thing, which is why sometimes Freudian thought is referred to as tripartite, being made of three parts. This third thing is the unconscious mind. It's the part of our mind that we cannot be conscious of. It's the things about ourselves that we just cannot deal with. For those of us who like an image to represent this with, I use the notion of a flashlight. When a flashlight is shined, the cone of light that it projects makes certain things oh, available to us. This is consciousness in Freud's thought whatever we're focused on at the time. You could shine the light anywhere in the blue area and all of the stuff in the blue area would be our pre-conscious mind. The one thing you can't shine the light on is the torch itself and that would be the unconscious mind. Very famously Freud says that without an unconscious mind you can't have consciousness. You can't make this stuff come into consciousness very easily. You need another flashlight. You need another mind to shine upon it. As he developed other ways of thinking about the mind, Freud made less use of the pre-conscious and conscious distinction, but he always held on to the notion of unconsciousness. Many of his later students declared the unconsciousness to be his most important discovery the revolution at the heart of Freudian thinking, the thing that mattered the most. In his later work, Freud developed the structural model of the mind. This is the id, ego and superego. It came out of his texts on Beyond the Pleasure Principle and the ego and the id. Here Freud was working with case studies still, although they were less personal now, often drawing upon insights provided to him by students and colleagues. The id is the most disorganized and instinctive part of our minds. It's capable of logically and physically incompatible desires and it's driven to satisfy our basic instincts. It's governed by the pleasure principle. This is um, a drive to minimize unhappiness or disaffection. It's a reduction of psychic tension, Freud says. It's a drive towards unconsciousness. If you think about the tiny child, newborn, what it wants is whatever will allow it to fall back into sleep and that is what the id wants. The opposite of the id is the superego. This is highly organized and is responsible for our sense of what is right and wrong. Tiny children are antisocial. Their demands have to be met before anybody else's and they will not be reasoned with. The superego is the opposite in the sense that it is highly social. It is the thing that allows us to fit in it wants the approval of others rather than its own satisfaction. Initially it identifies with the approval of its primary caregivers or parents, but this desire is displaced rapidly onto others, teachers, peer group leaders, best friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, ultimately figures in our public life, celebrities, media events. Between these two is the ego. This is the rational and decision-making part of our minds has to deal with the demands of the id but also the prohibitions of the superego and furthermore it also has to deal with the way the world really is. Freud says the successful ego is governed by the reality principle. Whilst it then listens to the demands of the id and works round the restrictions of the superego it first and foremost knows the way the world is and will cope with that. You may well have seen this kind of representation of Freud's topology. It has its problems, but it's a good way to hang ideas from. In another presentation, I'll return to criticisms of Freud, and we might pick up some of these then. 
Freud says that typically we don't have very much insight into the relationships between the parts of our mind. We rarely understand how these unknown factors influence the ways in which we behave. And this lack of insight is his key idea of the unconscious again. Now unconsciousness was not a new idea. Certainly thinkers before Freud had mentioned the idea. Uh, Henry James had said that um, subconscious and unconscious were not interchangeable. And other psychologists had observed that there were things going on in the mind that we were not all incapable of acknowledging. The difference was Freud made a bigger deal of how much we are influenced by these unconscious processes. And he also argued that they're not just things going on that we're not aware of. It's actually that we cannot be aware of them. That if we were to wake up to and realize that these things were going on in our minds, we'd stop being the people we are and start being somebody different. And if this happened in an unregulated way, people might suffer all sorts of terrible traumatic consequences. To illustrate this idea, imagine a person who has built their sense of who and what they are out of a highly restricted set of ideas about what is and isn't acceptable. Good manners, if you like. Freud would argue that they might not be able to accept their own desires, particularly their desires related to the things that they see as being the most in need of restriction. In our culture, these might be things like sex and violence. I'm using this clip from the BBC series Dinner Ladies by Victoria Wood to illustrate the kinds of bizarre and complex behaviour that might result from this situation. The Dinner Ladies of the title are discussing the reading habits of one of the younger members of the group. As you can see, Dolly has a very particular sense of what is and isn't acceptable. And she's very keen to reinforce that idea of herself to her friend Jean. But she won't let this stand in the way of her desire to look at the things that she says are unacceptable. In extreme cases, Freud argues that this can result in projection. This is where the person claims that it is everyone else that is interested in pornography, for example. This allows the conflicted person to think and talk about the desires that they find so unacceptable. They may, may even allow themselves to look at pornographic material, but only so that they can reject it and condemn it for anyone who gets excited by it. This is Mary Whitehouse. Mary founded the Clean Up TV campaign in 1964 as a response to what she saw as the moral degra degradation that the British media was promoting at the time. In 1965, the organisation was renamed National Viewers and Listeners Association and in the early 1990s it became Media Watch. She's widely recognised as having shaped the regulative frameworks that the British Broadcasting Corporation works within today. In order to achieve her outcomes, Mary had to review a substantial amount of precisely the kind of media that she was objecting to, what she would have referred to as video nasties and filth. She also routinely discussed this content in minute and graphic detail in public forums, debating the effect that such media would have on its audience. Just to be absolutely clear, Mary objected to the mass media focusing on sex and violence and in order to make her campaign work she reviewed large amounts of mass mediated sex and violence and then went into mass mediated forums like the news and talked about sex and violence. 
Many commentators have suggested that there was a significant amount of projection involved in Mary's campaign. Perhaps Mary would have been a lot happier if she'd have been able to reconcile herself to wanting to look at some porn every now and again. 